Hey, so if you're already familiar with this channel, you'll know that we've had a bit of a special interest in bad takes on the Ukraine war. We've criticized Hassan, Roger Waters, Jordan Peterson, Giblet Shingles, and even the Holodomor Hobbit. And if you're feeling a bit critical, you might understandably ask, are you not just kind of going after the low-hanging fruit, Loner Box? Well, yeah. What do you think I am, a serious person with a real job? But maybe we could step things up a bit. Because the fact is, very few of the opinions held by any of these characters are original. In fact, a good portion of their perspectives on how this whole thing started are really derivative from one person. Not a YouTuber, but a professor. A political science professor and international relations scholar called John Mearsheimer. Who is that? Mearsheimer comes from the school of thought known as realism, which sees foreign policy as an interaction between great powers who are driven to assert themselves and achieve hegemonic control over their given spheres of influence. Mearsheimer is often described as the most influential realist of his generation. So, when I say we're going for the big guns this time, realism doesn't really get any bigger than this guy. But anyway, what's his contribution to all of this? Well, Mearsheimer's big contribution to the war in Ukraine actually came quite a while before 2022. Way back in 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, he wrote a 12-page paper in the Foreign Affairs magazine called Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault, the liberal delusions that provoked Putin. The position he outlined here was then given in a lecture at the University of Chicago. At the time, however, no one really seemed to care. It wasn't until Putin launched his full-scale invasion in 2022 when Mearsheimer's position started to blow up. His lecture ended up getting 29 million views on YouTube, and his position on the war became a go-to reference for a surprisingly diverse political crowd. Just based on the people who have adopted his realist perspective, he truly does seem to be outside of the political spectrum, with his positions being parroted by those even on the far left. It's not Russia apologia, but simply a realist international uh, relations perspective. Okay, but because it goes outside of the no, Russia is bad and Russia is wrong and Russia is evil kind of liberal attitude that you hear in mainstream media and the far right. But I'm a realist. The majority of but I'm the, a realist. The yeah, but you're realist and you're Russia sucks. You're the Nobody uses you realism. Believe Nobody in cares about realism. Nobody. The and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You might think this diverse range of sympathizers is just an indicator of Mearsheimer's cold impartiality. Well, no. As it turns out, Mearsheimer does have his own political reasons for believing the things he does, but I think it would be better if you could try to guess what those positions are throughout the video. And at the end, we'll see if you got it right. As I'm sure you know, information as well as disinformation has played a central role in the Russia-Ukraine war. Every central claim seems to be incomplete without a counterclaim, making it all the more difficult to come away with a clear perspective. That's why I can think of no better sponsor for this video than Ground News. The Ground News app and website is a tool which gathers thousands of related articles for different particular topics around the world, telling you their political biases, their accuracy, and who the sources are owned by. This allows me to have insight into how people from different political persuasions are covering each story. For example, just this week, the US managed to allocate $300 million in military aid for Ukraine after a deadlock which has lasted since December. The story was covered by 193 sources, mostly from the political center. Because I wasn't really in an Alex Jones or OAN mood that day, I was able to filter my search so I could only see publications with high factuality. Using Ground News' biased insights function, I was also able to see that the left's coverage emphasized the details of the congressional negotiations over aid to Ukraine, the right focused on how these funding delays are affecting Ukraine's military performance, whilst the center emphasized the connection between Congress and the president when it comes to funding decisions. And really, knowing about all of these are important. In this case, going through this story with Ground News left me with a much broader understanding of how crucial this funding is. So, as for you, yeah, you, 
Go to ground.news slash learnerbox or follow the link in the description to start using Ground News yourself. And if you want unlimited access, you'll get 30% off if you subscribe through my link. Thank you Ground News for sponsoring this video. Anyway, first let's take a closer look at what realism actually is. And for that, I'm going to hand you over to a occasional friend of the show called Dylan Burns. Part 1. What is realism? My name is Dylan Burns. I'm a war journalist and streamer. I'm told I'm supposed to explain realism to you and talk about John Mearsheimer. Lucky me. Realism, as it pertains to international relations, developed as a framework in the aftermath of the Second World War. While realists will trace their roots back to Thomas Hobbes' 1651 work Leviathan, or even further back to Thucydides' A History of the Peloponnesian War, it didn't start to seriously develop as a framework until the mid-20th century. Political theorists like German-American immigrant Hans Morgenthau, whose 1948 book, Politics Among Nations, start to make sense of the interstate violence through the lens of statecraft. What drove nation-states to start wars with one another, to send their young off to die in the most horrific ways man can conceive, when the end result left once bustling communities in ruin? Theorists like Hans Morgenthau looked over the devastation and back into historical examples like the work of Thucydides in an attempt to find constant truths about international relations. This would eventually develop into a formal academic field, with scholars developing theories to try to explain what motivates states to act the way they do, and try to predict what they might do in the future, like the liberal or constructivist schools of thought. Liberal theorists emphasize trade creating economic interdependence, cooperation between nations, and the development of international institutions as tools to try to avoid interstate conflict. Liberal theorists also believe that domestic factors, like the style of government, affects the behavior of the state. For example, some believe in democratic peace theory, which stipulates that democratic republican-style governments are less likely to go to war with each other than other forms of government. Realists believe this type of thinking would not prevent war, but cause leaders to unknowingly stumble into more wars. Morgenthau would become a proponent of what is now referred to as classical realism. He believed that human nature is of self-interest, with egoism at its core, and that's reflected in how nation-states behave, pushing them into competition with one another. These states live in an anarchic system, meaning there's no power over watching it to enforce rules and order. There's no power coming to save your nation-state in a crisis to enforce some prescribed universal values. No America super cop is coming to save the day. Out of fear and suspicion of other states, Nations will attempt to build power, to protect themselves and their state's interests. But because of the inherent suspicion in states, one nation building power for defense, like a new air force expansion to protect its airspace, could be interpreted by neighboring states as new jets with ground strike capabilities that can bomb their cities, even if that was not the intention of those who initiated the air force expansion. This means that nation states with no interest in escalating or going to war could end up taking defensive actions that are then interpreted as offensive actions and then responded to in kind. This is because power, which realists view as drawn solely from military capabilities, is relative to the potential threat that it's guarding against. It's a zero-sum game for those involved. The state that increased its air force has increased its power, but it means the states around it, who view this expansion with suspicion, have seen their own power decreased relative to this new potential threat. One nation could respond by increasing its anti-air capabilities, increasing its own relative power, and decreasing the relative power of its airplane-loving neighbor. This means a nation could invest ever-increasing sums of money into defense, while not actually increasing the relative security or survivability of the state. What could increase in its place is escalation, or war. This is called the security dilemma, and is central to how realists think, and influences schools of thought outside of realism. This is when a state uses either internal balancing, the building of hard military power in order to increase your state's relative strength, or external balancing, building military alliances with neighbor states in order to stop a larger state from using coercive power against you. Hans Morgenthau also recognized attempts to maintain the balance of power as another potential flashpoint for conflict. While nobody can tell how many wars there would have been without the balance of power, it is hard not to see that most of the wars that have been fought have their origin in the balance of power. Realism would continue to develop during the Cold War, as nation-states rushed into arms races and nuclear weapons changed the landscape of diplomacy with apocalyptic undertones. The publication of the 1979 book, 
a theory of international politics by Kenneth Waltz, would continue to develop realism by forming structural realism, also known as neorealism. Structural realism disagreed with the focus on human nature to try to explain state behavior, instead focusing on an anarchic system to try to explain this. Hence the name structural realism. The structure of the international system explains the state's behavior. It states that survival is the primary goal of the state, and the pursuit of power is in service of this goal. In pursuance of this goal, realists believe states will act rationally on the world stage, with structural realists believing that nations are black boxes, meaning that the domestic politics doesn't impact the rational decision-making processes of the state. A democracy, an oligarchy, a technocracy, a monarchy, a military dictatorship, all of these governments should make the same rational decisions in pursuance of the survival of the state. This is also one of the main points of critique of theorists from other schools, who think that this leaves out a lot of important factors internally, like a regime type, ideology, all sorts of internal intricacies that are left out of this framework. Within structural realism, there are two camps of thought. As described by Kenneth Waltz, the first one is defensive realism. Defensive realists believe that nations, whose primary goal is survival, attempt to maximize security. As Waltz describes it, states will attempt to attain power in order to deal with relative threats to the state and to keep their position in the anarchic international system secure, but will do so reservedly. While Waltz does believe there does exist incentives against states cooperating, stating in his book, A state also worries, lest it become dependent on others. States do not willingly place themselves in situations of increased dependence. In a self-help system, considerations of security subordinate gain to political interest. Those issues could be overlooked, though, if a rival nation threatened to become a hegemon. A temporary alliance could form between the smaller powers in order to balance against the rival larger power. While a smaller state could choose to bandwagon and join the ascended power in challenging the status quo, Kenneth Waltz believed it was much more likely for smaller states to join together against the rising state. Because power is a means, not an end, states prefer to join the weaker of the two coalitions. Because of the cost of boundless conquests, the negatives outweigh the benefits in most circumstances for large expansionist wars, and the threat of counterbalancing is ever-present. The balancing arrangement of the international order, which is important for realist thought, is organized around a system of polarity, with each pole representing great powers which states organize themselves around. Three types of polarity are commonly accepted among scholars. Unipolarity, when there is one major power, and no other major powers to balance against them. American dominance after the end of the Cold War is an often cited example of unipolarity. Bipolarity is when there are two powerful poles, which balance against one another. The rivalry between the United States and the USSR during the Cold War is an example of bipolarity. And then there is multipolarity, when power is distributed between more than two great powers, creating more than two major poles. The period leading up to the First World War, the Thirty Years' War, and the Three Kingdoms period in China, for all my Dynasty Warriors fans out there, are commonly accepted examples. Kenneth Waltz believes that of all the power distributions, that bipolarity is the most stable. This is due to internal balancing, like the increasing or decreasing of a military budget, which is the primary tool of adjusting the power balance under bipolarity, which is much easier to control for unintentional escalation. This, though, is a hotly debated topic by international relations scholars from within the realist framework and from proponents of other frameworks as well. The other camp within structural realism, besides defensive realism, is offensive realism. Instead of attempting to maximize security to ensure their survival, as defensive realists believe, offensive realists contend that states are power maximizers. States will grow their power in order to become regional hegemons, and if they can achieve it, they will expand that power to global hegemony. While defensive realists believe that states will attempt to balance against the larger power that attempts to create hegemony, the author of the 2001 book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, believes that nation-states are much more likely to engage in buck-passing behavior. Buck-passing means passing the responsibility to confront a larger state to other actors. This is to avoid the cost that confrontation could possibly incur until your state is immediately threatened. This is where you find the subject of today's video, John Joseph Mearsheimer. The tragedy is that you could have two states who are content with the status quo and have no interest in fighting or competing for power. Nevertheless, because they cannot know each other's intentions, and because they operate in an anarchic system, 
They have to assume the worst about each other and have to compete for power. Most people reject the idea that we can't transcend this logic, but what I am saying is that we are condemned forever to a world where great powers compete for security and sometimes end up fighting wars. Part 2. NATO Expansion So, how does Mearsheimer apply all of that to Russia and Ukraine? Well, for him, Russia is one of the world's great powers with its own sphere of influence, and for centuries, that sphere of influence has, in one form or another, included Ukraine. And if someday another great power decided to start expanding their own sphere of influence towards Ukraine, it would only be natural for Russia to respond. Regardless of that great power's intentions, their expansion into Russia's sphere of influence would inevitably be seen as a security threat and an act of provocation. When Mearsheimer says the crisis in Ukraine is the West's fault, he's referring to a set of decisions that failed to respect the reality of Russia's sphere of influence after the Cold War. The most crucial failure, he argues, is the expansion of NATO into former Warsaw Pact and USSR countries. He introduces his paper by asserting, The United States and its European allies share most of the responsibility for the crisis. The taproot of the trouble is NATO enlargement, the central element of a large strategy to move Ukraine out of Russia's orbit and integrate it into the West. He then goes on to say, As the Cold War came to a close, Soviet leaders preferred that US forces remain in Europe and NATO stay intact, an arrangement they thought would keep a reunified Germany pacified. But they and their Russian successors did not want NATO to grow any larger and assumed that Western diplomats understood their concerns. The Clinton administration evidently thought otherwise, and in the mid-1990s it began pushing for NATO to expand. The first round of enlargement took place in 1999 and brought in the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland. The second occurred in 2004. It included Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia and Slovenia. Moscow complained bitterly from the start. During NATO's 1995 bombing campaign against the Bosnian Serbs, for example, Russian President Boris Yeltsin said, This is the first sign of what could happen when NATO comes right up to the Russian Federation's borders. The flame of war could burst across the whole of Europe. So, everything here is more or less factually correct. Like a good professor, you'll notice he doesn't tout the line that the US made a clear promise to Gorbachev not to expand NATO one inch eastward into the former USSR. And that's because this deal was never made. That one inch eastward quote is specifically referring to negotiations over the reunification of Germany, where there was a promise not to move NATO forces into the former GDR. Gorbachev himself admitted that the topic of NATO expansion outside of these boundaries was not discussed at all and that the promise not to move NATO military structures into the former GDR was fulfilled. Even Yeltsin, who later tried to invoke the promise, not so subtly admitted that all he could refer to was the spirit of the deal. So props to Mearsheimer for not throwing that one in. In fact, his argument has nothing to do with treaties or formal promises. For him, the gist is that whether or not any agreements were broken, NATO was still encroaching on Russia's sphere of influence. They were poking the bear by moving their military jurisdiction ever closer to Russia's borders, leaving the Russians threatened and ultimately cornered. And if I wanted to give a quick debate bro response to the issue of NATO expansion, I could just ask, has NATO ever invaded a nuclear power? Will they ever invade a nuclear power? The answer is no. NATO could literally cover every square inch of Russia's border and they would still be no more at risk of being invaded than they were in 1991. But this would be a lazy response. Whether or not NATO poses any actual physical threat to Russia itself isn't really the point. What matters is how that threat is perceived by people in Russia and how it influences the decisions of their leaders. Mearsheimer is right when he points out that Russia is a country that has been historically traumatized by Western aggression. In 1812, they were invaded by Napoleon's forces who arrived at Moscow only to find the city abandoned and set on fire. Unable to live off the land they had conquered, the French emperor's forces ultimately got too cold and ran away. 
After the Russian Revolution in 1918, they were invaded by 15 different armies who fought alongside the white forces at various points for seven years. And in World War II, they were invaded by the Nazis who actually reached the gates of Moscow, but ultimately failed to take the city, got cold, and ran away. From the Russian perspective, Europe cannot seem to stop producing leaders who clearly want to meddle with Russia, and no matter how non-threatening a NATO presence at Russia's border might actually be, it's going to instill some level of fear regardless. Fear which is perfect for leaders with imperialist ambitions to capitalize upon. The idea that NATO expansion into former Soviet and Warsaw Pact states would anger Russia isn't really all that controversial. The problem is that this only gives us one side of the story. Yes, you can say that NATO expansion runs the risk of provoking Russian aggression, but this is a catch-22. Because what also seems to provoke Russian aggression is the absence of NATO expansion. And this is where Mearsheimer tends to get challenged on his timeline. As he states, the first round of NATO expansion after the fall of the USSR didn't happen until 1999. Now, what was the newly formed Russian Federation getting up to before then? Well, from 1991 to 93, they supported pro-Russian separatists in the Georgian Civil War, which resulted in the overthrow of a democratically elected president, and the ethnic cleansing of a quarter of a million ethnic Georgians in Abkhazia. In 1992, they sent in troops to back a secessionist movement in the Transnistria War, and their illegal military presence in that region has persisted until the present day. For reference, Transnistria is this little strip of red in eastern Moldova, which incidentally shares a border with Ukraine. From 94 to 96, they fought a brutal war in Chechnya where anything from 30 to 100,000 civilians were killed, and the city of Grozny was reduced to a shelled wasteland, only to be raised again in a second war three years later. So when Mearsheimer says something like this, he is right, but what he isn't saying is how much Russia was willing to do in the mid-90s with whatever strength they had. If Russia did have the strength to take more former Soviet territories in the 1990s, what exactly would have stopped them? How do you think it would have affected the security interests of people in Eastern Europe? And I think this is a big part that Mearsheimer misses. It's that no one makes Russia's neighbors more eager to join NATO than the Russian Federation itself. Despite their weaknesses and the immense challenges they faced in the 90s, the Russian Federation made it very clear that they were willing to aggress on their neighbors before NATO had done anything. Foreign policy experts at the time were very aware of the risks that Russia could one day attack a larger country like Ukraine. In particular, one expert was actually willing to make pretty strong proposals to deal with the threat of Russia. And that expert was none other than John Mearsheimer. In 1993, Mearsheimer wrote an article in Foreign Affairs called The Case for a Ukrainian Nuclear Deterrent, where he argued for Ukraine to keep its stockpile of thousands of nuclear weapons left behind by the Soviet Union. Had his advice been followed, Ukraine would have had the world's third largest nuclear arsenal after Russia and the United States. And his reason for proposing this was, surprisingly, the threat of Russian aggression. In no uncertain terms, he says things like, Russia has dominated an unwilling and angry Ukraine for more than two centuries, and has attempted to crush Ukraine's sense of self-identity. Furthermore, many Russians would change the present border with Ukraine, and some even reject the idea of an independent Ukraine. Senior Russian officials, for example, have recently been describing Ukraine's independence as a transitional phenomenon, and have been warning other European governments not to open embassies in Kyiv because they would soon be downgraded to consular sections subordinate to their embassies in Moscow. If you were already familiar with Mearsheimer's positions from 2014 onwards, this might be quite surprising to you, because today, this is something you would expect to hear from one of his critics. But here, he is actually, in my opinion, quite accurately observing the Russian Federation's own internal motivations. He's treating Russia as a state with its own agency, and a base approach to former Soviet nations, which is independent of Western encroachment. Remember, this was in 1993, which is quite a while before the apparently provocative actions of the West. 
Mearsheimer is very aware at this point that Russia poses a threat to its neighbors with or without NATO expansion. The interesting thing is, this part of the analysis is completely absent from his work on Ukraine since 2014. Ultimately, his advice regarding Ukraine's nuclear weapons were not taken on board. In 1994, Russia, Ukraine, as well as these other wankers, instead signed the Budapest Memorandum, which confirmed the state's recognition of three former Soviet states and abandoning their nuclear weapons to Russia. In exchange, Russia agreed to respect the independence and sovereignty on the existing borders of Ukraine, to refrain from the threat or use of force, and to refrain from economic coercion. By the time Mearsheimer gave his lecture in 2014, all three of these pledges had been broken. So, all those years ago, he wasn't completely wrong. But despite this, two aspects of his analysis have completely disappeared. One, the fact that Russian aggression is not some novel response to NATO expansion, and two, the admittedly brief acknowledgement that Ukraine is an unwilling and angry subject of Russian domination. The Mearsheimer of 1993 recognized Ukraine and Russia as countries with their own complex histories and internal agency. But by 2014, their decisions just seemed to be passive responses to the whims of the Western world, to the point where even the slightest overstep from NATO is enough to spark total chaos. For an example of what he considers to be an overstep, let's just look at what NATO did just before Russia's invasion of Georgia. In April 2008, the 20th NATO summit was held in Bucharest, Romania. Ukraine and Georgia were both in attendance, hoping to join the NATO membership action plan. However, neither of them got what they wanted. This was mostly because of opposition from France and Germany, who incidentally were trying to appease Putin, who had warned that NATO enlargement would be taken as a direct threat to the security of their country. The members capitulated, and Ukraine's and Georgia's aspirations to join NATO were essentially frozen. So, where was the overstep? Well, after denying the two countries what they wanted, they were offered a review of their status before the end of the year, and in nothing more than a conciliatory message, were told that eventually, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. So, no action plan no advancement of either country's status, just an acknowledgement that they'll join someday. This was all it took for Russia to invade Georgia and break off a fifth of its territory later that year. Now, in case you're wondering if a statement like that is really a good enough reason to start seizing territory from other countries, well, Mearsheimer would say the morality doesn't really matter. As he puts it, it is the Russians, not the West, who ultimately decide what counts as a threat to them. And this quote here, I would keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the video. With regards to Ukraine, on the other hand, you might have noticed a pretty wide gap in the timeline. By 2014, Ukraine's status with regards to NATO was exactly the same as it was in 2008, and even then the Ukrainian people were mostly opposed to NATO membership. So, if Ukraine's NATO status hasn't changed since 2008, why the aggression in 2014? And for this question, Mearsheimer does have a bit of an out. For him, NATO expansion is the central issue, but not the only issue. The other issues he highlights are EU expansion and the promotion of democracy. Together, these form what he calls the West's triple package of policies. And when I first read this, I thought, Okay, so how much does Ukraine really have to give up just to make Russia happy? They can't join NATO, they have to stay in Russia's economic sphere and away from the EU even though it isn't difficult to see why they'd be against that, and they also can't allow for democracy promotion, whatever that is. Um, we'll come to that one later. With all that, if the goal is to avoid provoking Russia, does it not look like Ukrainian sovereignty just kind of has to step aside? And maybe you're starting to see the problem with allowing Russia to ultimately decide what counts as a threat to them. If that's the case, they could just describe any policy they don't like as a security threat. I'm sorry, you want economic relations with the EU? Well, you can't have them because that's against our security interests. 
I mean, for the 21st century, especially given that Ukraine has never signaled any intention of invading Russia, this is ridiculous, isn't it? In any case, it's a pretty open secret that the interests of smaller countries like Ukraine are just not really a factor in Mearsheimer's analysis, or for realists in general. As far as his work goes, Ukrainian agency is irrelevant. And obviously he can't be too vocal about this because he has to sell his perspective to an audience, but it isn't hard to see how the wishes of the Ukrainian people are really just an inconvenience to him. But as he says, NATO expansion is only one element of Western strategy. Let's have a look at the other two, starting with part three, EU alignment. So this part of the story is far closer to the events of 2014. In fact, it was the dispute over EU alignment, not NATO, which was the central issue in Ukrainian politics leading up to the Maidan revolution. And you might be wondering, why did Mearsheimer make NATO the central issue instead? Well, I don't know for sure, but I feel like I can make a decent guess. If your argument is that the West should respect Russia's sphere of influence, well, asking to keep Ukraine out of a Cold War military alliance doesn't seem like a big ask, especially to a neutral observer. However, if you come in guns blazing with the idea that Ukrainians have to be kept away from EU economies and in line with a country that has, incidentally, held them under an imperial boot for 400 years, then you might look like a bit of an asshole. And you would look especially bad if you were making this case against the collective wishes of the Ukrainian people, which is exactly what happened. In 2010, the newly elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, signaled that Ukraine might one day join the Eurasian Customs Union with the former Soviet states of Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. This announcement naturally raised a few eyebrows, firstly because it would have required a constitutional amendment, but also because Ukraine was already having talks over a customs agreement with the EU. The terms of these two agreements were incompatible, and the result was a split which dominated Ukrainian politics for the next few years. But when I say split, I don't mean quite down the middle. Support for the EU deal was consistently higher, and I mean double digits higher amongst Ukrainians at the time, and in recent years, that gap has only grown wider. I mean, what the f is this? It's like the results of a Syrian election. This obviously puts Mearsheimer in a difficult spot. If his argument is that Ukrainians should essentially give up their economic sovereignty just to make Russia happy, he's going to sound like a bit of a quack, and you can tell he really doesn't want to own this position. In his lecture, he goes over some polling data and correctly shows that in 2013, Ukraine had mixed opinions on joining NATO, with people in the West generally in favor and people in the East generally opposed. This fits in quite nicely with his analysis of Ukraine as a divided nation, with one side leaning towards the West and another leaning towards Russia. But here he also does a bit of a sleight of hand by lumping this data in with polling on EU integration. The cities up at the top are in Western Ukraine and the cities down on the bottom are in Eastern Ukraine. So you can see very clearly that people in the West would like to join the EU. People in the East have little interest in joining the EU. Those are the EU numbers. Here are the NATO numbers. I mean, these two charts look virtually the same. But all of this tells you that you have a badly divided country. Now, did you notice what he did there? He said people in the West would like to join the EU, people in the East have little interest in joining the EU. Which is a pretty careful selection of words. If you look at that chart again, notice how every single one of these regions, including those in the East, still preferred the EU over the Eurasian Customs Union. So he is being a bit sneaky when he says people in the East have little interest, especially given that this was a binary choice, but he also tries to say that this chart looks virtually the same as the one regarding NATO. And sure, you can say they look kind of the same, but uh, come on. In the NATO survey, there are several regions that would vote against joining NATO, whereas the Eurasian Customs Union was opposed all over the country. Even in the East, it was always the least favoured option. 
Of course, he completely glosses over this difference because suddenly it makes his narrative look really bad. And it makes him look even worse when he comments on what happened afterwards. By 2013, Ukraine seemed to be on track to finalize their deal with the EU. In the summer of that year, Putin had visited Ukraine with the hopes of persuading Yanukovych to change course, albeit with no luck. The deal had already been approved earlier that year by 315 out of Ukraine's 349 members of parliament. The position of the majority of Ukrainians and their representatives was clear, and Yanukovych, despite his firmly pro-Russian leanings, knew it. So, in a last-ditch effort to stay Ukraine's course, the Kremlin, in violation of their 1994 agreement, resorted to economic coercion. They started with a ban on chocolate imports from the Kyiv-based Russian company, citing health concerns, and by the middle of August, Russia was applying enhanced border checks on all goods imported from Ukraine. The intensity of these inspections was unprecedented, and suddenly, billions of dollars worth of Ukrainian goods were held up indefinitely at the border. The Russian sanitary chief denied accusations that they were engaging in a trade war, but other statements from Kremlin officials seemed a bit more ominous. In September, one advisor to Putin said, We don't want to use any kind of blackmail. This is a question for the Ukrainian people. But legally signing this agreement about association with the EU, the Ukrainian government violates the Treaty on Strategic Partnership and Friendship with Russia. Signing this treaty will lead to political and social unrest. The living standard will decline dramatically. There will be chaos. Then, at the end of November, Yanukovych suddenly halted the deal by voting down six bills that were aimed at meeting the EU's terms. It was clear at this point that he had been in further meetings with Putin and talks with the EU were now suspended. That same evening, protesters gathered at Maidan Square in Kyiv to oppose the decision. This was the first day of what would become known as the Maidan protests. Less than one month later, Russia offered to buy $15 billion of Ukrainian debt and to cut the price of Russian natural gas imports to Ukraine by a third. Yanukovych duly accepted, and most Ukrainians took this as a sign that the EU deal was dead. Now, let's take a look at how Mearsheimer describes this chain of events. The idea that Ukraine is going to do a deal exclusively with the EU and the Russians are going to be left out in the cold is not something that Putin is willing to countenance. He puts significant pressure on the Ukrainians. He offers them a terrific deal. And as you can imagine, the EU is not offering Ukraine a particularly good deal because you know how much corruption there is in Ukraine. So, there's a lot going on here. I feel like he could have done a bit more to elaborate on what that significant pressure entailed, although the fact that it was an act of economic coercion that directly violated Russia's end of the Budapest memorandum might have made it harder for him to set up for this next part, where he describes the Russian deal as terrific as opposed to the EU deal which is not very good. Which is a very odd thing to say. As far as I knew, there was no way of telling how good or bad the Russian deal was because a lot of it was unknown. We knew that it included a $15 billion bailout and a reduction of natural gas costs. We also knew that the interest rates on the loan and the cost of gas would be subject to review every three months, but besides that, there was basically nothing. As far as we knew, there wasn't even a written document, just a verbal agreement. What we did know was that the bailout would have put a huge dent in Russia's National Wealth Fund, and that the reduced cost of gas was set to put a lot of pressure on Russia's state-owned firm Gazprom. Which raises the question, what was Russia getting in exchange for this? Was there any guarantee that the gas discount wouldn't be completely rescinded at the first review, or that the interest rates wouldn't be spiked? Well, no. A common theory was that the deal would set Ukraine on course for joining the Eurasian Customs Union, and it isn't surprising that people were a little wary of that. As the leader of Ukraine's opposition party put it, I know only one place where there's free cheese. It's a mousetrap. The EU deal, for what it's worth, was completely public and, you know, the majority of Ukrainians and an overwhelming majority of representatives were in favour of it. So... Why is Mearsheimer describing the Russian deal as terrific? 
I mean, he is a foreign policy expert, the head honcho of realism. Maybe he knows something we don't. Well, in the Q&A section, an audience member asked him to elaborate on the Russian deal and... Eh. You talked about, like, Russia offered Ukraine a deal involving uh, Russia, the EU, the IMF, uh, Ukraine. Can you, like, lay out the specific terms of that deal? And, in 2013. Yeah, in 2013 uh, 13 when, when they offered them the deal. And two, this is a little more in-depth. What, what's the first question, though? What were the terms of the deal, exactly? I'm not the sure. terms of the deal, Russia, uh, Russia. You want me to outline Ukraine. the terms of the deal? Yes, if you, if I, I don't know, I honestly don't know what the terms of the deal were. Okay, well then we'll just skip that one. <laughs> oh, interesting. So it's a terrific deal, much better than the EU deal, but you have no idea what the terms are. John, what are you doing, John? Of course, there are some people who would see this as evidence of Mearsheimer having, at the very least, some pro-Russian sympathies. The evidence for that wouldn't be too hard to pull together, but I think what's more interesting is how it exposes a fundamental problem with realism. For Mearsheimer, the fact that Ukraine belongs to the Russian sphere of influence isn't so much a moral claim as a factual one. It's just the way things are. Any attempt to disrupt that power balance is a catalyst for conflict and escalation. But the question becomes, what do you do when that power balance is mostly being disrupted by people within a sphere of influence? In my opinion, the honest realist would have to answer this question by saying, tough shit. If the price for balancing power is that Ukrainians give up a substantial chunk of their economic and political sovereignty, so be it. But Mearsheimer didn't become the biggest dissenting voice on this subject by being completely honest. That's why he obfuscates around Ukraine's clear desire to lean towards the EU. It's why he ignores the fact that even Eastern Ukrainians still have their own red lines when it comes to Russian influence. It's why he downplays the economic coercion that Putin placed on Ukraine before 2014. And it's why he describes Russia's deal as terrific despite having no idea what the terms of the deal are. For Mearsheimer, Ukraine's desires are either irrelevant or an inconvenience. What's much more saleable, as opposed to condemning the behavior of Ukrainians, is to blame the EU, NATO, and the United States. And this downplaying of Ukraine's agency takes Mearsheimer to an especially strange place when he discusses the third issue, promotion of democracy. And for this one, once again, I'll hand you over to Dylan Burns. Part 4. Promotion of Democracy The next element of the West's strategy to peel Kiev away from Moscow, according to Mearsheimer, is the West engaging in the promotion of democracy and the spreading of Western values in Ukraine. Victoria Nuland, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, estimated in December of 2013 that the United States had invested more than $5 billion since 1991 to help Ukraine achieve the future it deserves. As part of the effort, the U.S. government has bankrolled the National Endowment for Democracy, the Nonprofit Foundation has funded more than 60 projects aimed at promoting civil society in Ukraine, and the NED's president, Carl Gersham, I love saying his last name, it's very fun, has called the country the largest prize. After Yanukovych won Ukraine's presidential election in February of 2010, the NED decided he was undermining its goals, and so it stepped up its efforts to support the opposition and strengthen the country's democratic institutions. Victoria Nuland is the current Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, who recently announced her retirement. And at the time, during Euromaidan, she was working for the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. The $5 billion that Victoria Newland was referring to, and has become the source of many theories online, covers a whole swath of different government agencies and issues, starting from the collapse of the Soviet Union all the way up into the Euromaidan protest movement. According to Nicole Thompson, an American State Department official, $2.4 billion went into programs promoting peace and security, issues like combating narcotics, fighting human trafficking, and enforcing border security. 1.1 billion went into projects around economic growth. 300 million went into humanitarian assistance grants, 
which could be made into things like fighting HIV-AIDS, uh, Chernobyl cleanup, etc. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was independent, but the fall of the USSR left it in economic ruin. Ukraine was seen leading up to the collapse of the Soviet Union as a nation with a possibly bright economic future, with Deutsche Bank in 1990 ranking Ukraine as the Soviet Republic with the most economic potential. But once Moscow lost control, and the Soviet Empire crumbled, Ukraine's economy went into a tailspin. The old Soviet economy in Ukraine was falling apart. Many factories closed, mass unemployment took hold, and millions of Ukrainians fell below the poverty line. While neighboring Poland was experiencing the shock of rapid but successful reforms, Ukraine was experiencing the shock of no reforms. In 1993, Ukraine's annual inflation rate reached 10,200%. It set a world record at the time. Issues ignored for years bubbled to the surface. The economy was in free fall. Workers went without work, adolescent drug use and homelessness skyrocketed, and the old Soviet elite attempted to enrich themselves by plucking the remains of the old Soviet industries. Ukraine was in desperate need of assistance, economic and humanitarian, which not only came from the United States, but other nations of the world as well. One example is Japan, which helped Ukraine with $3.1 billion in assistance as of 2018, with the first payments being approved in the mid-1990s. Was it just the United States helping Ukraine try to get the future it deserves, as it was so ominously quoted, or did these other countries invest in Ukraine as well, which Ukraine accepted willingly? But if the issue is a lack of reform and rampant corruption, dumping money into an atrophied institution run by the corrupt old guard will only achieve so much, and is terribly cost ineffective. Of the five billion originally quoted, 800 million of those funds actually went into the objective of governing justly and democratically. But over a roughly 20 year time period, what did this money actually do over the years? A Senate hearing on January 15th, 2014, on the implications of the crisis in Ukraine, could give us an idea. The Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, Thomas O'Melia, said that, Since 2009, the U.S. government has provided more than $184 million in assistance to Ukraine in programs under the rubric of governing justly and democratically. Those programs focus on professional development programs for judges, members of parliament, legal advocates, civil society, democratic political parties, elections, and independent media. After decades under Soviet rule, and then the centralization of control by oligarchs in the 90s, Ukrainian civil society was underdeveloped and incredibly vulnerable. There were issues of corruption spanning most of the government, lack of transparency, decrepit bureaucracy, attacks on the press, and oligarchic control of everything from media to industry. Both Ukrainian governmental and non-governmental institutions needed a massive overhaul. One example of an attempt to achieve this is ProZoro. After Euromaidan, in an effort to increase transparency in the procurement process, the ProZoro project was started and was supported by USAID. One of the ways government officials engage in corruption in Ukraine, much more boring than the cartel weapon smuggling fantasies of presidential hopefuls, is by officials giving contracts to friends and possibly getting a kickback in return. ProZoro made it much easier for the public to peer inside this process. By making government agencies have to put out contract offers on an open source freely accessible to anyone in the public. When a deal is made, the Ukrainian public can view the bidding date, who was involved, and other documents that were previously undisclosed. Everyone can see everything, is the motto of the program. And while it hasn't solved all corruption, that mentality has helped the Ukrainian government save over $8 billion. Not all programs that the United States has backed has been this successful, and it should be emphasized that Ukrainian anti-corruption activists and pro-democracy advocates were always at the forefront of laying down the groundwork for these advancements. Without them, progress on any of these major issues would be impossible. When the American government sets aside funds to help train election monitors, there has to be people on the ground willing to go through the program and do the work. If someone wants to expose government corruption, they have to be willing to stand up to do it despite possible repercussions. The Ukrainians are always the ones struggling for the future that they deserve. The organization that John Mearsheimer chooses to focus on to display American democracy promotion is the National Endowment for Democracy. The National Endowment for Democracy, or NED for short, was founded in 1983 as a private nonprofit largely funded by Congress. It originated in the National Security Decision Directive 77, 
which is a national security directive signed by President Reagan, meant to strengthen the organization, planning, and coordination of various aspects of public diplomacy of the United States government. Public diplomacy is when the government attempts to communicate or interact with foreign populations, often in an attempt to influence the public towards foreign policy objectives. This could be as wide-spanning as worker exchange programs, culture events, language training, or even what is traditionally referred to as propaganda. The NED was created to support democracy and civil institutions abroad, mostly through issuing grants to organizations and activists helping to strengthen civil society. Due to the many activists that are awarded grants being dissidents against the ruling parties in their home countries, the financial ties to the United States and its promotion of free market economics, the NED has found itself at the center of much ire. If you are a supporter of Viktor Orban, you are not going to like the NED funding journalists that write articles highlighting his ever-tightening grip on power. If you are a socialist who argues against market-based reforms, some of the groups they give grants to, you won't be a huge fan of. A Chinese government official in Hong Kong or Xinjiang is not a happy camper. If you're an isolationist who doesn't like foreign aid, well, there's no pleasing you, is there? But focusing on Ukraine, what has the NAD been funding there? If you go through the NAD's grant search, what allows you to search three years into the past of countries that the NAD has awarded grants in, Ukrainian data is not accessible. Data on Russia is, so is Serbia, so is Mexico, and so are many other countries, but not Ukraine. Through the power of the internet, though, we can use the Wayback Machine to go back to when that data was still listed in the search system, with the date being removed on February 25th, 2022, the day after the Russians invaded. Why was it removed? I don't know. Maybe there was a fear of grants awarded to activists being used to target them. Maybe they were hiding Henry Kissinger's secret underground laboratory, testing MK Ultra on unsuspecting locals in Cherkasy. It remains a mystery. Either way, we can still go back and see what the grants were awarded to. The data from 2014 to 2022 shows $12 million in grants for anti-corruption reporting in the Zaporizhia region, coverage of human rights abuses in occupied territory, activism around internally displaced people, radio networks, fostering youth civic engagement, developing online human rights courses, training for journalists, resource centers for activists, veteran rights groups, cultural projects, training for political leaders, Ukrainian short films, think tanks, and more. I implore you to check the data that we do have yourself, with too many grants to list here, ranging from ten to fifty to a hundred thousand dollars each. But I have some takeaways relevant to the Mearsheimer analysis. When Mearsheimer says that the NED stepped up support for the opposition, to be clear, the opposition is not just some political candidate or a certain political party. The opposition here, in the instance of the Yanukovych government, is anti-corruption activists, journalists, rights groups, students, and others who are made into the opposition through the actions of the government, including direct attacks on the press, protesters, and freedom of assembly. If the NAD supports an organization meant to promote a strong civil society, and then the government passes legislation meant to ban protest, civil rights organization becoming your enemy is a given. While the United States did support anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine, it did not force the Yanukovych regime to engage in rampant cronyism and turn anti-corruption activists against them. The NED can fund as many youth workshops as they want. Only Yanukovych's government could give the order for the Bakut Special Police Forces to beat student protesters, throw flashbangs wrapped with nails into crowds of protesters, or shoot the youth who asked for change. This brings me to something that John Mearsheimer doesn't consider in his piece, the interests of the Ukrainian people, and how ignoring the domestic factors around the dignity of Ukrainian people will promote instability. In a period of four months from the start of the Euromaidan crisis to the end, Yanukovych and his backers in Moscow seem to exacerbate discontent. From pre-existing issues of corruption, to Russia pressuring Ukraine through economic coercion to back away from a popular EU association agreement in violation of prior treaties, Yanukovych going back on his campaign promise to go through with the EU association agreement, Yanukovych announcing his decision to withdraw from the agreement in the middle of the night in an attempt to dampen the public reaction, the brutalization of protesters, the hiring of gangs, of gangs to suppress protests, and a lack of transparency on the deal made with Russia behind closed doors means that Yanukovych and the Russians 
were speed running, speed running, turning the Ukrainian public against them. Can the crisis truly be the West's fault when the ruling party, its backers, and its agents on the street did everything possible to aggravate the crisis and turn civil society in Ukraine further against them? Do you blame the revolutionaries for the revolution or the regime for neglecting and mistreating the people enough that they felt it necessary to take action? Ukraine is not a blank slate, just a pawn on the larger chessboard of geopolitics, but a complex cornucopia of citizens with diverse interests, values, hopes, and dreams. And by taking a hammer to that cornucopia, in an attempt to derail the culmination of five years of negotiation with the EU and ram through a new unpopular agreement with Russia, the government stepped on the toes of civil society, overplayed its hand, and brought upon itself their downfall. If we must consider democracy promotion provocative, then authoritarian encroachment should also be considered so as well. Not only is little to no attention paid by Mearsheimer to suppression by Yanukovych's government, the same lack of consideration is given to Russian involvement, meaning there are probably a lot of people who saw his lectures without having key information to properly analyze the situation. They don't know about Putin trying to encroach upon Crimea as far back as 2003, fostering corruption, economic coercion, propaganda campaigns, keeping Yanukovych supplied with anti-riot weapons, alleged ties to dioxin poisoning of presidential candidates, and then there is actions after 2014 the majority of which were denied as they were happening. Like Russia constantly shipping separatists and mercenaries in eastern Ukraine weapons, and directly intervening militarily any time Ukraine looked like they could get the upper hand. Would a state like Ukraine and other states in Europe seeing this aggression not naturally band together once Russian ambitions towards territorial revanchism is made clear to the European community? In fact, from a defensive realist perspective, the argument could be made that what we are seeing with Europe uniting around Ukraine is just balancing, taking its course against an aggressive state attempting to become a regional hegemon. Part 5. Contemporary Analysis At this point, it seems like a lot of Mearsheimer's version of the story hinges upon downplaying Ukraine's agency and their authentic desire to disentangle themselves from Russia's influence. On top of that, he seems very uninterested or just unaware, of what the pre-2014 status quo meant for Ukraine and what they would have had to give up in order to keep it in place. Hopefully by now you can see that expecting Ukrainians to just tolerate the Kremlin's actions indefinitely is simply naive. Not very realistic, you might say. Ooh. And there are plenty of times when his unwillingness to engage with this side of the story frankly weakens his analysis. In his 2014 paper, he seems to believe that the annexation of Crimea was completely unpredictable. In his own words, Putin's intentions would almost certainly have arisen before February 22. But there is virtually no evidence that he was bent on taking Crimea, much less any other territory in Ukraine, before that date. But this isn't entirely true. According to this paper from 2011, the conventional wisdom of the time was that Moscow did have intentions to annex Crimea, but were merely waiting for the opportunity to do so. So, that is at least some warning, and even the author of this particular paper, who disagreed with the conventional wisdom, still conceded that Russia was only holding off on annexation because the status quo of the time was in their favour. Before 2014, as well as having a staunchly pro-Russian president in Ukraine, Russia had unfettered access to Crimea's naval base in Sevastopol. They had enough sympathy from the mostly ethnic Russian locals, they were able to saturate the media space with pro-Russian propaganda, and they enjoyed the fact that Crimea's economy, with its lax tourism laws and almost non-existent land registry, was the perfect environment for corrupt Russian business practices. In 2013-14, after the Maidan protests, that status quo was ruined, and the annexation of Crimea was the response. In short, the cost of keeping Ukraine inside Russia's sphere of influence was that it could only happen at the expense of Ukrainian sovereignty. But again, that is an uncomfortable bullet to bite. That's why Ukraine's preference for economic integration with the EU is something he never really faces head on. 
It's because, for some reason, Russian dominance over Ukraine has to be seen as the natural order, and anything else has to be seen as an unwelcome disruption. But what happens when spheres of influence change? The Baltic states, for instance, used to be part of the Soviet sphere of influence. Today, all three of them are members of NATO and the EU. If Russia ever attacks either of them, the result would be nuclear war. Ukraine has been cooperating with Western powers in one way or another since the 1990s. They cooperated over the Budapest Memorandum, the non-proliferation of WMDs, EU integration was supported by a plurality of Ukrainians and by an overwhelming majority of elected representatives. In the last 10 years, that famous East-West split in Ukraine has been quickly disappearing. The proportion of Ukrainians opposed to NATO membership is now in the single digits. At what point could a realist start saying that Russia is the one foolishly aggressing on a nation that has been, at least by his framing, won over by the Western sphere of influence? Is the Western defense of what they consider to now be their sphere of influence not also just what great powers should be expected to do? Why is it only that the West was poking the Russian bear? After all, Russia did violate agreements that it signed with the United States regarding Ukraine's sovereignty. Could that not be seen as Russia poking the they-them liberal soy bear? And by that measure, couldn't a realist say that Putin was the one who carelessly crossed a red line clearly set by another great power and is now paying the price for it? Maybe even Mearsheimer could agree with that. What they're doing is not trying to conquer Ukraine. There are many people who say the Russians are going to go on a rampage, they're going to try and reestablish the Soviet Union or a greater Russia. Uh, and so forth and so on, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, Putin is much too smart for that. You remember what happened when the Russians invaded Afghanistan? You remember what happened when we invaded Afghanistan? You remember what happened when we invaded, invaded Iraq? You remember what happened when the Israelis invaded southern Lebanon? You want to stay out of these places. In fact, if you really want to wreck Russia, what you should do is encourage it to try and conquer Ukraine. Putin, again, is much too smart to do that. Oh yeah, um, I should also mention that as far as bad predictions go, he does have a few of these. In August 2022, he argued that Moscow did not invade Ukraine to conquer it and make it part of Greater Russia. And then a month later, Putin formally annexed four more territories in eastern and southern Ukraine. So, yeah. In my humble opinion, a truly neutral realist could actually invoke the great power theory on either end for Ukraine. But coming back to what we mentioned at the beginning of this video, in case you're still wondering why Mearsheimer seems to tilt his bias so often in favor of the Russian perspective, well, you might be surprised to learn that it's not actually because he's pro-Russia. It's because he's pro-America. Like, pro-America in the Cold War sense. In a book where he opposes America's relationship with Israel, one of his arguments is that he equates it with the Soviet Union support for Cuba. How? Because he considers both cases to be examples of great powers escalating conflicts by meddling in someone else's backyard. For Mearsheimer, Cuba was America's backyard, and actions like the embargo or even the Bay of Pigs were just the United States understandably protecting their sphere of influence. In the beginning of this video, I introduced Mearsheimer as beyond left and right, but he only really appears that way because his left-wing supporters just haven't realized that they've essentially been duped by an old-school Cold War conservative. The real reason he doesn't want the US to get involved in Ukraine is because it puts the United States firmly at odds with Russia. And in his own words, Russia is the natural ally of the United States against China. Oh yeah. By supporting Ukraine, Mearsheimer's fear is that the US has driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese who are now threatening US hegemony. And apparently, the US cannot antagonize Russia because the US needs all the allies it can get to contain China. That's why he says what he says about Russia and Ukraine. And somehow, leftists and Marxist-Leninists continue to fall for it.